how do you high, make that first offshore hire? You can use an agency. You can use a, you know, you and I both know people that have agencies where you can pay $1,500 and you get 40 hours a week. So you're paying $1,500 to an agency that kind of manages that VA for you. And, and, or you go to Upwork and you just search for something and prices are high on Upwork. You look at Upwork and the prices seem high until you start talking to them, then the prices get lower or is there, are there uh, other options? Cause I would imagine once you get into it and once you're in it, you, you get addicted to it and you're like, oh, I can now I, this works for the simple VA stuff that I thought I would do it for. Now I can hire somebody for $500 a month or a thousand dollars a month. They can start doing other things for me and you kind of know how to manage them and how to find them. But if, how would you do it today? It, knowing what you know now, how valuable they are, but how would you go about finding your first one? It's a great question. I wouldn't use the agencies because your relationship is with the agency, not with the resource. And you don't have control over how that person feels, engages. That's really important. Culture, dude, you know, it's so funny as a young man, when I first started, I always thought like, you know, when people talked about building a company culture and crafting your values, I just hated those conversations. I was like, this is obnoxious, you know? And, and now I just, I see the immense value in it. And if you hire through an agency, there's no way to inject your culture into that person, period, full stop. Upwork is the wrong network because Upwork is a whole network of entrepreneurs. Real hard to get an entrepreneur to come get a job by definition, you know, and, and they're already making a ton of money on Upwork because they've kind of cracked the code and they're entrepreneurial and they're willing to take the risks and go outbound, et cetera. So what you want to do is there are job posting boards for all of these various geographies around the world. And I'd really like Latin America right now. My newest EA, Sergio, smartest kid on the freaking planet, man. I just fire off my problems to him all day and he just knocks him. Just, it's like skeet shooting. Like I, I lob him up and he's shooting him down and, and he's kind and he's attentive. They celebrate our same holidays, which is really helpful because if you're hiring out of India, you're going to get some folks that have just diametrically opposed schedules. And, and this is the part that I'm a little hesitant to say, but I'm just going to say it. They have accents that are not repellent to the U.S. year. So for you and me, every single time we've ever had a horrible call center experience, it's been because we're on the phone with somebody from India or from the Philippines. And it's it's frustrating. And you've built that neuro association. And that's not to say that you don't hire people from India or Philippines. Some of my best employees ever are from both of those countries. But that is to say, if you're going to make somebody an early stage customer contact, I like Latin America. Because the 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 Latin accent is one that we're all acclimated to. And it's not an instant like, oh, here we go. These guys are just, you know, farming this crap out. And it's huge. It's this massive landmass. You know, I mean, Latin America, is, it's not just South America. It's Central America and parts of North America. And, you know, for two grand a month, you can get sea level performance, like truly sea level. I mean, it's hubris to think that we're the only country that produces intelligent people, right? As a matter of fact, <laughs> a casual observer might assume the opposite. So <laughs> there's these just these amazing resources, dude. If you go, if you go put out the feelers, post, you know, craft the job description. And I have some, I don't know how deep you want to dive on the specific tangibles, but Let's do I, it. Okay. So here's the thing about the job description. One, you're going after people that don't necessarily know they're looking for remote work. They're going to normal job boards looking for normal jobs. So you have to, when you post the job, you have to say remote in the title. And then you have to repeat that throughout the job description. And you might even need to define what remote means. I say, hey, this is a remote. And then in parentheticals, I say work from home position. At the top of my job description, I say, when you apply, please make sure the subject line reads as follows. And then in quotes, I actually read the instructions. Here's why this is important. You're paying so much more than other people pay that you're going to get an onslaught of submissions. It's an impossible task. It's a needle in a stack of needles. So what you need to do is have a really strong filtering mechanism. So in the subject line of the email they send you, I never use HR portals or submission portals. I always just use email. Um, it makes it easier from a process management standpoint, especially because it's my EA now that manages these processes for me. They say, I actually read the instructions. If they submit and that's not the subject line, I don't even look at it. Skimming through my description here, and I can share my screen, Eric, if it would be helpful for you to follow along. Yes, it would. Uh, would you mind enabling? Sorry, everyone that cannot uh, actually look at this. And what we might do is we might just put this out on a video out there. A little So anyone listening, we'll probably post this as part of this as a video so you can see his screen. Yeah. 
Would you enable All right, man. Sharing, sir? There we so go. So you should be co-host now. Cool. So um sell yourself first. You know, again with the with the remote, they're gonna be a little skeptical of you. They might have been taken advantage of. And you know, this is true, even if you're hiring onshore. I hate job descriptions. Some of these things when I, you know, I, I always go on and I look at what people are doing in the competitive market. And so many of these things they approach from above. They're like, we're the best in the whole wide world. And in order to apply, you must. And, you know, it, it feels like a help, like a like a, a wanted poster. And instead, like make them feel like you're a fun place to work. And you can do that however you want. Inject whatever personality you want. Uh, tell them what it is that you're looking for first. Because there are going to be cultural idiosyncrasies, you know, potential language barriers, whatever. Don't start listing the, the actual job description. Instead, give them an example of their average day. Like, hey, this is more or less what your day looks like. Uh, the next section that I have here is salary and growth opportunities. This is really, really, really important. People want to know there's a future in general. Um, and especially when you're talking about remote work, they want to know that they're not about to land themselves in you know, just a, a dead-end call center trap. So I like to say that this job starts at X. I never, ever list a range. There's a couple of reasons for this. Culturally, certain people have a very difficult time with negotiation. The Filipinos are like this. They're the least combative people you've ever met in your entire life. And if you list a range, that's already stressful. So just say, hey, this job starts at X. Uh, and then give them very specific guidelines as to what's going to happen. Um, you know, I have here, and this is just an example job description that I use for client managers, but you're going to work under a full client manager as you learn the trade. So I'm basically saying, you're going to get some training. I'm not going to throw you in the deep end. You're going to be assigned clients slowly as we begin to build your confidence, like letting them know, hey, this is we're going to build up to this together. And then here are the growth opportunities and the growth opportunities are real, by the way. I can't begin to tell you how many people have started from the literal bottom. The girl that runs my agency now, Leandra, was a client manager. She's now the COO. I go on to list the ideal candidate. You can only have three to five skills in any job description. If you have more than that, you're asking for too much. And I, I hear this all the time from business owners. Oh, I need someone who knows graphic design, video editing, content creation, Google ads, and you know a little bit of finance. I'm like, really? Have you ever met that human in your, could you do that? So just hire for one thing. Hey, for I got a question um, in this too. Cause so, so you, you put in this out, this is the job description on a job board. Mm -hmm. do, do you say full-time, part-time number of hours? And like, is, do you have a full-time position for for this particular candidate right away? Or do you just know that they can work into that full-time position? That's a really good question. I will hire part-time if I don't have uh, enough work for somebody yet. And if I list part-time, then then I will put, you know, part-time job. Um, and then if it's full-time, I'll put full-time job. Usually most job boards have you check that selection okay. so that it's filterable. And uh, if you're hiring part-time, just take the numbers that I'm giving you and cut them in half. And you're still doing really, really well. I like part-time hires for a lot of reasons, but for the business owner, it helps you scale into the resource too. Because if you're like, dude, I actually really do need a video editor because I'm putting all this content out, but I don't have enough work for one full-time. Well, this lowers the barrier to entry. You can use the personality profile stuff. I used to use this really heavily. I used to use a company called crystalnose.com. I stopped using them because they just got too expensive and my process is good enough to not need it. In the beginning, it can be really helpful though. Especially so what are you, if you looking for in a personnel? So you can do a lot of different ones. Like you could do disc and all, all these different ones. So yep. that don't cost very much. What do you look for in a personality profile? Well, the key is to VA? go get somebody, or if you have a group of people that are already doing this job well, get them to take the personality profile and that'll tell you what to look for. Don't arbitrarily approach it and think, I need someone who's persuasive, assertive, confident, and direct. You don't know. Go get the people that you think are really awesome at this job, get them to take the personality profile and then back into it that way. Good. Uh, I put my skunks on the table. And this is really, 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 really important. List every reason that it's going to suck to work for you. You know, you might say, hey, sometimes you're going to have to deal with irate customers or hey. So when you say put a skunk on the table you're the, and you're saying make sure you're comfortable with and then you list them out. Line by line, element by element. You might say. This is part of the filtering. Like that's they exactly right. this is the filter. Yeah, you want to talk people out of the job. That's amazing, man. <clears throat> All right, so we will have this posted. If you want this, go into the Facebook group, FranchiseSecretsGroup.com, and um, we'll have a, a way for you to get it there. We'll probably just post it in there as a, one of the main videos there. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.